he is holiness itself beyond the power of thought to grasp or of word to express, beyond the power of all praise. He is an almighty God. He is not only the creator, he is the sustainer of everything that is. If God ceased to sustain this universe, it would collapse in a moment. And standing on nothing, he took the hammer of his own will, and he struck the anvil of his omnipotence, and sparks flew therefrom, and he caught them on the tips of his fingers, and flung them out into space, and bedecked the heavens with stars. Uh, so good to see you. Well, we haven't done this too many times yet, have we? Welcome home. Is it, we still say welcome home. I think we can say it for the next six months. If you're gone six months, and you can say it for the next six months, and it doesn't get old. It's just so nice driving up in our own parking lot and uh, walking into our own church. And so grateful for the churches that open their doors. Wow, amazing. Pastor Nathan and, and uh, Pastor Sam, but still, man, it's good to see you guys. You sound great. And uh, today, I'm just, after the first service, I'm still out of wow. I, you know, I, honestly, I'm just, I'm just going to shoot the bull with you just for a moment. Uh, it just felt like I didn't cover like I wanted to cover, but at the same time, the information just is, um, it, it hit me. It's, not, it, it, it's hit me this whole week, and when it's told this whole series, just talking about who God is. And I, I hope that today, you know, no matter where you are in your walk, whether you're a super veteran Christian who's like on fire, or you're investigating, or you feel like you're far away, or whatever, I hope that your mind is blown about God, I really do, uh, it's such a, a three-letter word, it's such um, infinite knowledge, infinite ability, um, beyond our imaginations, never be able to grasp who God is. And for us to, you know, even approach it, not that we do, and I don't think we all do, as as an elementary beginner topic, it's not that because uh, Tozer says, whatever we think about God determines everything about us, how our worship is. Our view of what God, uh, what what the image we have of God in our mind just determined how we responded to Him. To talk about, it's your breath in my lungs, I'm going to return this breath back to you, but if our image of God is low, there is absolutely no way that we could begin to worship God because you, you can't, you won't worship what you don't fear or have awe or love. So I, is, I, I hope that the information today, which is totally out of my pay grade, and you'll see that in just a moment, but um, I hope it blows your mind about who God is, and that's why I wanted to tackle something like this today, and at the same time, blow your mind about who God is, but at the same time, blow your mind about how, how much He wants to be near you. Blow your mind about His transcendence, but blow your mind about how, how close He is to you. And that we, we would leave here and live life with eyes wide open in awe, always in the heart of worship at the same time, uh, just with this, this uh, confidence that God is with us. And if God is with us, who can be against us? Amen? So, we're closing out the series on God. I thought we would, you know, we're closing it out. We'd go for the uh, Genesis, the beginning of the book of the Bible. So, Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You can learn a lot about a person by what they create. Paul mentions in Romans that from creation we can know the invisible attributes of God. That which you don't know about God the invisible attributes with things like his omniscience and all-knowing, all-powerful, um, everlasting. Those things that are invisible to us can be known through the creation because you basically trace it. Here's what he created. Therefore, if he created this, then he must be. And so you, a lot can be known by what someone creates. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. The earth was without form. It was void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep as well. It, it stops there. That's like at the end of verse 2. And then it says, God said, let there be light. And there was light. He separated the light from the darkness. And then it said, let there be. Then he separated the water from the, the dry land. Verse 10 says, 
God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together, he called the seas. And God saw that it was good, and it was good. It is good. It is good. I mean, would you agree with me that this earth that we get to live on, there's so much good. I mean, that you travel, you look at the photographs of the beaches and the mountains and the vacations that we get to take and the greenery, you drive up, you know, 69 North and see the tall pines and see big oaks and uh, see babies and crickets and elephants and on and on and on and on. And it's, it is, it is good. It's good. It's massive. It's massive, too. I mean, we just think Texas is massive. How many of you thought, am I ever going to get out of Texas? Right? It's like drive through Texas. It's massive. It's beautiful. It's home. It's home. It's your home. It's home to 7.6 billion people, which we, we don't get an idea. I, I'm, I'm going to speak for myself. I don't get an idea when I talk about millions and billions. I, I don't deal with that type of stuff. I wouldn't mind, but I just don't. It's a blows our mind 7.6 billion people so God looking down at 7.6 billion people is probably like us getting a stick and putting in an ant pile right and just seeing so many ants it's like wow they're all over 7.6 billion people and twice that many mosquitoes (laughs) all but 100 of them are here in southeast Texas right or they will be in a few months and this place that we call home is suspended Mark showed some photos last week of just earth suspended in space. And this place that we call home is also moving. Right now, it's it's a wonder that we can just sit down and that when we walk, walk, walk outside that we don't have to hang on to a tree or hang on to the wall because you may not know it now, but you're, you're spinning, right? Science lesson, I'm not the science guy, but I had to be this week. I'm sure I'll forget it in about two weeks, everything I just learned. So, earth is spinning on its axis in one spin, like from this moment to this moment tomorrow, it'll be one spin, it'll be one day, right? And you're like, oh, I knew that. Well, okay, great. 25,000 miles, you'll cover between 20 and 25, depending on where you live, you'll cover 25,000 miles. Now look, this guy's created, God has created this. I mean, you're spinning. Now, to do that, you know how fast you're, you're spinning? How we're spinning right now? <laughs> like 900 miles per hour. Like right this moment, you're like, no, yeah, 900 miles per hour. It's like, how do we not just fly off the face of the earth? Like next time someone says, I'm about to fly off the handle, say, no, you're about to fly off the earth. <laughs> you, you know, you, it's amazing to me. And that's just while we're spinning, like on the axis. So while we are spinning, we're also rotating around or orbiting the sun. That trip is one year. So one orbit equals one year. And that is a 584 million mile trip. Now if someone asks you if you're going somewhere this year, say, yeah, I'm going somewhere. I've got, a, I've got plans, 584 million mile trip. Yes, I'm going on a trip. The speed is 67,000 miles per hour. I know, I don't understand it either. I can't grasp it either. So not only are you spinning 900 miles per hour, you're also orbiting as you do that 67,000 miles per hour. And just to give you an idea of that, that is 1,117 miles a minute. Meaning that 59 seconds from the time that I just said this, you could be in New York City. A little over a minute you could be in New York City. I think it's pretty amazing that with the speed that we're spinning, that I don't have to hold on to anything. I I am so proud of my family that we're spending 900 miles an hour and 67,000 miles per hour and we don't have any more spills at our house than we do. I'm like, I shouldn't be angry anymore. I don't applaud my family. In fact, next time you're drinking coffee, like your, your latte, or your frappuccino, or your mocha, whatever you like to get, you're at the coffee place, and, and you're able to drink the whole thing and not get anything on your shirt, you just ought to get on your favorite social media and just say, spending 900 miles per hour and 67,000 miles per hour, I just drank coffee. And you ought to be amazed. I didn't get any on my shirt. Crazy. 
crazy that we're able to. It, it was, now, now we can say, well, wow, that's, that's crazy, that's amazing. But I'm saying, what does this reflect about God? That's where I think we read scriptures like, and God created the heavens and the earth, and then we go on and created light and separated the light from the darkness. But God created. God created what we're talking about. There is a design, an intentional design. There is something there that points back to this person of God. How should we respond to that? Or what does that do for you in your mind about God? I'm telling you what, it freezes me. It really does. I don't know what to think sometimes. I just go, I just, it's like, look very dumb probably. It's like, what? I, it's hard for me to believe. And here's to add to the craziness. Not only are we spinning like a spin cycle and orbiting, but the sun is also orbiting around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And one orbit of that is called a galactic year or a cosmic year. You want to hear the speed of that? 514,000 miles per hour. 514,000 miles per hour. That would be 143 miles per second. Meaning that when I say second, you could be in Katy, Texas now. That's how fast the sun is orbiting around the Milky Way, the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Now, how long do you think it would take for the sun to make one full orbit? You might want to guess. You're not going to be around. <laughs> 230 million years. What does that tell you about the size of the Milky Way galaxy? Do you know that they measure the size of the Milky Way galaxy in light years? And they say it's between 100 and 180 light years in diameter. They only do it in, in many light years. What is 176,000 miles per second is the travel, is what light travels in a second. It's unbelievable. This, these, are, these are numbers that blow my mind. And, and so Southeast Texas, so Earth, here we are, Earth. And, and Southeast Texas is our little cubicle, right? It's our little, our little closet, our little cul-de-sac in the neighborhood. Beaumont, Texas. You guys know what Beaumont, Texas means? Here's what it means. Right there, a beautiful mountain. I'm thinking the people who came up with that had a one, two, three minute drinks that day. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what you were seeing. How many drove by this coming to church? <laughs> the only way you're going to do it is to pull it up on your phone. Hold it out the window. Hey, here's the Google Earth of Beaumont, though. <clears throat> this is where we live in this big earth that we have. You, get, you didn't get to choose the galaxy you lived in. Or the, you, know, you really didn't get to choose the planet that you're born on. It's the only one that there's intelligent life that we know of. Uh, but you did get to choose where you're going to live. And this is where you chose to live, Beaumont, Texas. The hundred and I think about 118,000 other people. Southeast Texas is larger than that. And then if you had a rough night last night and you're just wondering where you're at right now, here's where you are. The cathedral, <laughs> the cathedral, look at that beautiful, look at that beautiful building. <laughs> uh, cathedral in the, in the neighborhood or something, I don't know. Just in the middle of nowhere. But here we are, this is our home. And this is where we are on planet Earth. Now we know Earth isn't the only thing in the solar system, right? It has some friends, some other planets. And let's just take a little journey through the planets. Starting there on the further side of, or the, the outer side of the sun, furthest distance from the sun, sounds better. Earth isn't the biggest planet, but it is, it is a very privileged planet, it's, a, it's in, the habitable, in the habitable zone, or what's called the Goldilocks zone. After Jupiter, I believe Mars is going to be coming up. You know, Mars is fourth from the sun. If you plan on going to Mars this summer, you might want to pack a parka. Uh, about negative 80 degrees. Then here we come, the Earth. It's 
where we, we reside. Then you have Venus. Venus is not habitable. You're looking at 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Carbon dioxide is so heavy. The atmosphere is so strong. So the atmosphere is not conducive to life. Mercury and then you have the big daddy of the solar system. And there we are. Remember how big earth was? Look at it in comparison to the sun. The sun comprises 99.8% of the total mass of the entire solar system. And it is ferocious. 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, no, is it 900 degrees? No, 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface. 93 million miles from the earth. So light traveling, 186,000 miles per second, would take eight minutes from the moment it left sun to get to us. So if you're ever out with a friend and you're watching the sunset and you're thinking, here, we're watching the sunset. No, you're not watching the sunset. You're watching the sun sat. It sat eight minutes ago. And the sun that you're not seeing, it left eight minutes ago. Just say, hey, are you enjoying the sunset? They're going to look at you like, what? Or they're going to say, you know, what time does the sun rise? Or look at the sunrise. No, no you're late. <laughs> it rose eight minutes ago. Eight minutes ago because of the distance. So, Bria, let me see that golf ball. I'm going to practice. Here, practice your putt. <laughs> it's a moving hole. You get a hole in one every time. So, if, if the... Um, and I wish I had to mark this out better, but if the earth was the size of a golf ball, the sun would be 15 feet in diameter. All right, that means nothing to us, right, when we don't have real markings. But just take this imaginary marking. It's about around here. From here, at the edge of the, the monitor, to here is about 15 feet. About 15 feet. Here, here we are, I don't, know where, I don't know what dimple you're on right now. Here we are, the earth. Here's the earth in comparison to the sun. Wait, this is the world we live in. Like, th does this make you have a shrinking feeling? <laughs> does it make you feel really, really small? I mean, sin has a way of puffing myself up. I'll just be honest with you. So, uh, I think we all have pride problems. What? I mean, <clears throat> if, if Earth was the size of a golf ball, you would fit 1.3 million golf balls inside this thing that we call the sun. 1.3 million. And, and we think the sun's a big deal, and it is a big deal, but it's also enveloped into something that is way bigger than it itself, something called the Milky Way galaxy, this place that we also call home. We've never been outside the Milky Way galaxy. This is only a composite because, I mean, we can't get a picture like this because we haven't been outside. But inside our Milky Way galaxy, the sun's not the only star. There are a minimum, and I'll just be conservative because I don't want to miss it. There's a minimum of 100 billion stars. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. <laughs> I wonder what you are. No, you're amazing. And there's so many of you. 100 billion stars in our galaxy. But do you know they estimate that there's a minimum of 100 galaxies other than the Milky Way galaxy? As Mark showed last week that when they, they pointed the Hubble telescope, they, they wanted to look and see at this black space that there was nothing there. That as they did that, when they zero in, there's just billions, millions and billions of stars that they did not know existed. Psalms 19.1 says the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens will declare the invisible attributes of God. And the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day it pours out its speech and night to night it reveals knowledge. Now look, I, I don't want anyone to confuse what I'm saying here to think that I'm saying we ought to worship creation. I just want you to know that I think we should see through creation. Here you go, Brie. We ought to be able to look at what's created 
and learn about what the Creator is like. Let it blow our minds. Psalms 33 and 6 says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the word of the Lord. You get that? Y'all hear that? By the word of the Lord. What we just talked about, the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth, all of their host. Talks about God sitting on the circle of the earth. Talking about, you know, the foot, the, the earth being his, his footstool. So when we look at this, you know, where, where's Praise Church? Where are we? Where's the earth? You, you can't see it. It's, it. it's too small. Where's the sun? If the sun was on there, it would be right there. If I had a Sharpie, if I had a Sharpie, and I took the Sharpie with the, the mark, and I made a mark right there, that mark that would be on the screen, that little bitty dot would be bigger than our entire solar system. All the planets and the sun combined. You, you wouldn't even be able to see, it would be bigger. We can't even see our solar system. And it stashed away there, circling the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And we're on this little thing called Earth. So on February the 14th, Valentine's Day, 1990, Voyager went to, uh, or it was finishing its mission to the four largest planets that we have or that we know of. And NASA decided to turn its cameras for one last photograph of the Earth. And this is, what it, this is what it took. And that's Earth. From 3.7 billion miles away, that's the picture they took. I, I don't get it. I don't I see how you can take a picture 3.7 billion miles away. I, I can't even get cell phone service in this kitchen here. I'm like dropping phone calls. It's like, can y'all get y'all's priorities straight? It's like, give me some phone service. It won't be dropped. This is called, you go home and Google this, you can Google it now if you want to. It's called the uh, pale blue dot. Pale blue dot. Carl Sagan uh, was a notable and incredible astronomer at the time. He passed away since. He's also an ardent um, atheist, an enthusiast e atheist. And here's what he had to say when he saw the picture of the pale blue dot. He said, look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. Right there on that pale blue dot, that very, very small thing that we call earth. The aggregate of joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, economic doctrines, every hunter, forager, every hero, every coward. Every creature, destroyer of civilization. Every king, peasant, young couple in love, mother and father, hopeful child, inventor, explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species live there on a moat of dust, suspended in a sunbeam. He says, our posturings, our imagined self-importance, Kind of like our pride. The delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. Then he makes the conclusion, in our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come <clears throat> from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. In our obscurity, in all the vastness, there is no help or no hint that will help no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. Now, there's a lot that I agree with here. That smallness, yeah, absolutely, I feel that, Carl. But I don't agree with the insignificant part. Because just because we are small does not mean we are insignificant. Because I do believe there is somebody that came from outside to help us. He makes a statement in our obscurity. In all this vastness, there is no hint that will help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. And that's what's amazing to me. We go through all these stats, and this is science, stuff that God created that we're able to test and see and determine. And God created it, but at the same time, He, he cares enough 
to, uh, to become one of us. And to take what I, uh, my wrongs, it's like the, the prodigal son, you know, to be the father that when he sees me returning, would not only wait for me to approach him, but he will run. No, no, no. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying the one that created everything we just did, we saw. The one with all the intelligence, all the knowing. The one could sit back and say, oh no, you made your bed, you lie in it. Is the one that the prodigal son story says that this great God actually is the one that ran, took off in a sprint because he was looking. It's the same one that Luke 15, go over it again, read Luke 15, the three parables. says that, that if there, there's a guy that has a hundred sheep, and 99 are safe, but one's not. He'll leave this, this person we just talked about, that this person here, who's created everything that you know of, will leave 99. How irrational is that? To go after you. To look for you. To look for me. Does that not blow our minds? And it should. But in the mystery of it, we worship. We'll never be able to grasp it all. But let's blow our minds because the word G-O-D should blow our minds. God created the heavens and the earth. Spectacular and have this shrinking feeling. And we should have a shrinking feeling. And pride should go out, but we should never feel like there's not any value when you have scriptures that say in the Word, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that God so loved the world that He, that he gave. Yeah, we'll have a shrinking feeling looking here. Yeah, we're so small on this, in Texas or on Earth or one of the planets or in the galaxy. Yeah, we're definitely not insignificant. Uh, Augustine says it like this, men go abroad to wonder at the heights of mountains, at the huge waves of the sea, at the long courses of the rivers, at the vast compass of the ocean, at the circular motions of the stars, and we have, and we, we're doing it, this is what we just did, and they pass by themselves without ever wondering, what are you saying, and they pass by a miracle of themselves, that you alone, just sitting here, and that you're able to hear me, and that you're able to see me, and that the, you know, how you were woven in your mother's womb, and the gestation, the development of a human being from two different people, from two cells, right? Here, here's a picture of a, um, let me get this right, eight cell marula. Eight cell. Three to four days. Three to four days. And here, here you are. Now, I know it didn't make the family photo booth. You know, it's, it's not on the wall. Your moms don't have this on the wall. But here you are. Before that, you were one cell. Do we need to talk about that? You know, one cell from your dad, found one cell from your mom. And by the way, men, you ought to be you know, super proud of that one cell. It's a heroic, heroic act. Long swim, fight. One cell from your mom, one cell from your dad, 23 chromosomes come up, and they come together, and they begin to map out a 3 billion character DNA. No, 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 you, you get that? 3 billion character DNA, um, let me get it right, code, that will map out the color of your eyes, the color of your hair, what you will be like physically. 3 billion code DNA. 18 days after conception, your heart starts beating. 18 days after conception. Four days after that, blood starts flowing through your system. Here's five months in the womb. Aren't you cute? There you go. It's a miracle. This could even happen. I don't, I don't know that I ever had any more greater God moments than the birth of my children pure miracle of life and say oh my not, not, not in a derogatory sense but just oh my god how can this be how could you allow this to happen and to be a part of it between week three and ten 
one million optic nerve endings leave your brain to search for one million optic nerve endings that have left your eye all to come together so that you could have the vision that you have right now in about the fifth month of your gestation being an embryo or fetus your the eyes had already fused together in about the fifth month something begins to happen where the eyes begin to open the eyelids begin to open and now you could see we may be small in this vast creation but you look at the creation and how he he put you together in your mother's womb you may be small but you're not insignificant not only because of your physical creation but there is a cross There's a cross looming over history that is proof that the God of all creation cares for his people so much, so loved the world that he would give his only son. There's a cross that looms over history. It looms over this building. It looms over your life right now. Say that the star speaker, the one who spoke the stars, was the sin deliverer. The universe maker was our... The lover of our souls. The lover of our hearts. There is no mountain he won't, I mean there is no shadow he won't light up. No mountain he won't climb up coming after me. There is no wall he won't break down. No lie he won't tear down coming after me. (laughs) You try to stand between him and you, bringing you back home, there's going to be a fight. And there was a fight. And if we could only grasp with this incredible, unimaginable, huge God that we could talk about, who threw the stars out, who is so transcendent beyond anything our minds could imagine. And let, it, let us be in awe. And let us wake up and have eyes wide open and, and have a little godly fear about who he is and worship but at the same time approach the world with the confidence that if he's for us who could be against us that the one who created the world thought us thought so much about us that while we were yet in sin he died for us our lives would change maybe we wouldn't sweat the things (laughs) as much as we do maybe our trust in who he is would grow And I just hope that without a formal altar call, which we don't do a lot around here, because I want this to be a thought-out decision, following Christ, that if you feel distant from God, this person that seems so distant from us, that you would be able to accept how close He is, that you would respond. This most powerful God wants to be very intimate and know you, and that in your heart today, as we go into a worship song, you say, God, I, I am far from you. I am a sinner, but I need a Savior, and I believe that you are the Son of God, and I'm asking you to save me today, and let's begin a new, a new life. We're going to sing a song in just a moment called So Will I. I've been planning on doing this because the song talks about creation responding to God, all of creation responding to God. And it's about to rock your world. It's about to be a song you're going to go home and download. It's going to be on your playlist. It plays throughout our house all the time. Connects us to God. I want to go through the lyrics. It says, says, God of your promise, you don't speak in vain. No syllable, empty or void. For once you have spoken, all nature loves this, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice it just speaks of design all nature and science comes from God nature can only do what God allows it to do what God breathes in it to do and it's all a response to the voice of God anything it does any capacity it has is only there because God has designated it to have that goes on to say as you speak a hundred billion creatures catch your breath evolving in pursuit of what you said. If it all reveals your nature, so will I. 
Here's the reason why I'm taking time to explain this. Because I don't want that word evolving uh, to throw you a curveball at you. I want to look at that and I don't want there to be any confusion surrounding the word evolving. We do not, as a church, affirm macroevolution like change outside of a species, like a monkey to a man. We do not affirm that. That's not what we're referencing there. Like a dog can change into a cat. What we are referencing and what we do believe is that any change that occurs within a species can do so only because God has designed it or allowed it to do so from the very beginning. Like finches or moths, beaks, colors. That God has designed those things that within that species, given it the ability, the latitude to change for its own survival. That all nature and science follows the voice of God. But could I get you to stand? Now, before we go into the song, I'm going to pray. But let me just ask you, why don't you pray to a God that I just described? Fair enough? Won't you respond to a God that I just described? God, <laughs> you blow our minds. There is no one, nothing to compare you to. And may our minds be continually, consistently blown from this day forward. Of your power, but of your, your tenderness, that you would leave 99 to pick one up to put on your shoulders, to bring back to safety. God, may we respond to you, not just at this moment, but for our lives in a way that's appropriate to be loved by someone like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said?